This particular uh, woman, Laura, um, was treated successfully. She was a, a professional a woman in lithium. She went from severe bipolar illness, where she was um, both manic and suicidal, to um, functioning uh, exceptionally well without episodes on lithium. She developed a chronic kidney disease. And when I saw her, she'd pretty much uh, been unable to work and home bound for approximately um, three years. She was tried on other medications without any help, um, but her physicians insisted that she stop lithium due to her um, kidney disease as a result of lithium intake. When I saw her, um, we did um, lots of nutritional functional medicine testing other than um, B12 um, deficiency. We um, started her on low-dose lithium, and over a period of time, she was able to uh, do exceptionally well and um, improve her mood, return to work, and, and function quite well until she followed up with her kidney doctor, and her nephrologist uh, insisted that she stop the lithium. Even though for um, almost two years that we followed her, her kidney function had never changed. So there was no deterioration. We were monitoring it closely. Um, it actually improved slightly, um, but really no significant difference on t t uh, she had taken uh, 20 milligrams, no, actually 10, 10 milligrams of lithium a day. Um, when I first saw her. So upon the insistence of her nephrologist, she stopped her lithium, this low-dose lithium, and she noticed that she was not feeling well. She noticed her mood fluctuations, depression, irritability. And without telling her nephrologist and without telling me, she was able to titrate her lithium orotate, low-dose lithium orotate, five milligram pills, to four times a week. So that's where you see the 20 milligrams per week. She found if she took less than that, she noticed her mood fluctuations, and she didn't need more than that. So on her own, without telling any of her physicians, um, she comfortably took 20 milligrams of lithium orotate to maintain her stable mood and uh, continues uh, to do well with a euthymic um, even mood. She, it took her a year to tell me that she was back on the lithium orotate, uh, she still has not told her nephrologist. Uh, this was a, a dramatic case, but I've seen over the years hundreds of cases of looking at um, low-dose uh, lithium as a treatment for major psychiatric illness, as well as for um, minor personality symptoms like irritability and anger, as well as we'll talk a little bit about the uh, prevention of cognitive and memory issues So um, a little basic, um, lithium is an element. You see it here in the periodic table. Um, and I want you to remember um, the atomic weight of lithium, the 6.94. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So it's the lightest of all metals, and it was discovered um, as a salt in 1817. Uh, lithium is found throughout the world. It's um, unevenly distributed, and that's really important because we'll be talking about lithium in uh, water supplies, and it varies dramatically through, um, throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, there are large lithium um, salts, um, flats in uh, South America, Chile, and China, as well as um, the picture below is a reserve in Wyoming. Um, as a mineral, our body can't synthesize lithium, so we need it from our food supply. The required dose is around a milligram a day, and the average U.S. Uh, consumption is around 650 to 3,100 uh, micrograms per day. Again, varies dramatically by source of water and soil and mineral content. These are just some variations uh, from Mexico to Austria, and you see it's quite significant in terms of this uh, variation in intake. 
this team has a long and uh, somewhat um, sparkling history, if you will. In the early 1900s, uh, lithium was considered a uh, health tonic. This is um, from a 1902 Harper's Bazaar, um, drinking uh, lithiated water um, as a, a health tonic. In the early um, 1900s, lithium was also uh, both used and advertised um, as a treatment for hangovers. So there's a um, another bottled water that was called Wake Up. It was a lithiated uh, water that was marketed for the treatment of hangovers. But our more interesting and fun story with lithium has to do with the um, the soda, if you will, 7-Up um, that we've all heard of. And there's rumors and, um, and history um, that the name of the soda that was um, started in 1929 was based on the atomic element, uh, the atomic weight of lithium, 6.94. They rounded it up to 7, hence 7, and as something that will improve your mood, 7-Up. So it was uh, sold as a lithiated lemon soda to improve your uh, mood. And if you can see in the advertisement, it blends out the harsh features and dispels hangovers. Takes the ouch out of the grouch. So that was how 7-Up um, um, was started. And up until 1950, 7-Up had uh, lithium added to it. So an interesting, fun history, um, but let's talk a little bit about the, the science. And one of the things we're going to keep focusing on is trying to understand lithium as um, neuroprotective. And as a neuroprotective agent, um, it has uh, significant implications for uh, mental health and, and brain function. This is just a summary of some of the um, earlier studies looking at lithium um, used before an insult and lithium given after an insult to a brain injury. Here, um, a cerebral ischemia was induced in animals who were given lithium daily for 14 days before the insult and then two days after. And with the added lithium, there was decreased brain damage by 50%. And then we have many, many other studies, um, and we have lots of models of uh, using neurotoxins to induce brain damage in animals as well as in tissue culture. And if lithium is added to that test tube and or given to these animals, there's a dramatic decrease in brain injury. So in addition to protecting neurons from damage, and this is quite... Um, uh, you know, well, uh, research science. What is really most fascinating to me is lithium's ability to actually stimulate new neuronal growth. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But these are the two kind of uh, recurrent themes that we think about when we talk about um, lithium and brain function. Protecting neurons from damage as well as stimulating neuronal growth. As a, a psychiatrist, um, lithium was an um, important part of my training and is still an incredibly uh, powerful medication that has potentially life-saving properties. Lithium as a medicine uh, was first discovered by John Cade, an Australian psychiatrist who was a prisoner of war. Um, and as he started his research, he started looking at... Um, uh, uric acid, and he was trying to um, inject uric acid in um, animals, and to dissolve the uric acid, he used lithium. And when he injected this uh, lithiated um, substance in uh, guinea pigs, they became calm, and then he started uh, experimenting with himself, and then uh, prisoners and uh, patients, and uh, noticed a dramatic improvement in kind of mood and irritability. Um, his work was, again, around 1950, but it was uh, at least 20 years, 1970, when the uh, FDA approved lithium 
for uh, use for bipolar illness in the United States at the time called manic depressive illness. In Europe, it was approved much earlier because there was a number of uh, decent studies that were done after Cade's discovery. So as we've uh, used lithium as a, a pharmaceutical, the, the research is, is dramatic to um, really uh, miraculous in terms of a couple properties. Um, to me, the most significant is its anti-suicide property. It's one of the few medications that we have in psychiatry that has dramatic anti-suicide properties. These are some of the original studies, and the numbers are just um, quite dramatic. 300 bipolar patients have been ill for over eight years when they started lithium, decreased suicides and attempts by sevenfold. When lithium, if was discontinued, the suicidal rates increased 14-fold. And then really dramatic, the first year off lithium, suicide rate rose 20 times. A number of other studies demonstrating this anti-suicidal, um, not only in patients with bipolar illness, but this was a, a couple studies looking at depression. Um, Meta-analysis is pooling lots of studies. And here you see the overall risk of suicide and attempts 88.5 lower with lithium treatment compared to controls. And then the last study, uh, again, this uh, meta-analysis trying to um, look at these um, 48 studies with over 6,000 patients. 88.5% lower risk of suicide. I mean, think of the uh, public health implications. Uh, think of the um, um, the lives that, that, that could be saved. But the, the good news is always um, dampered, if you will, by the, the concerning news. Um, and as a psychiatrist, I rarely use what is considered prescription dose lithium. Um, the lower doses, the side effects are drowsiness and tremors, urination, thirst, nausea, and vomiting not uncommon for many patients taking lithium at 600 to 1800 milligrams per day. At the higher dosages, and, and every one is different in terms of what milligrams per day uh, would produce side effects, but the kidney damage and the thyroid impaired thyroid function are the most common. The kidney damage is irreversible and the thyroid damage is also usually irreversible. So I have this medication that has this dramatic, I believe, miraculous effect on, on suicide and um, I can't use because of its side effect profile. One of the things that I do want to share that, that should be common knowledge in, in the field is most of the side effects, particularly the lower doses, can be decreased if not eliminated completely with essential fatty acid supplementation. Completely eliminate hand tremors, frequent urination, and some of the nausea um, with adequate um, uh, omega-3. I typically use omega-3 with low-dose omega-6 as well as vitamin E for the side effects of lithium. But I've um, been using low-dose lithium for 20 plus years and rarely would I ever use prescription strength lithium at this time. So what I want to sh uh, switch now is this concept of um, lower doses of lithium, uh, micrograms to milligrams. Um, again, our prescription doses are 600 to 1800. What I'm going to spend the rest of the evening talking about are dosages um, from, you know, 500 micrograms to 20 milligrams. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. It is uh, not homeopathic dosages because these are quite a measurable amounts that we're talking about. So when we talk about these low doses of lithium, we need to understand first that lithium is, is in our food supply. It's um, mainly in, in vegetables and grains. Um, I've read and I'm uh, not really confirmed that thyme, the spiced thyme, is the known, highest known food source of, of lithium. But the vast majority of the lithium that we receive is from our tap water. It's from the water that um, 
in our soils and in our communities. So different um, communities around uh, an individual state could vary, as well as different um, states around the country, as well as different countries. So we have this uh, low-dose lithium in our soil, in our food supply, and is this significant? Does it mean anything? And the, the research here is, is also staggering. The amount of lithium in the drinking water, unrelated to any nutritional supplement or pharmaceutical, has very significant effect on mental health. Uh, I'm not sure if you um, have been aware of some of these studies, but they were done in the 70s and 80s. The first studies looked at 27 Texas counties. So Texas is a big state. If you took water from one side of Texas and then water from the other side of Texas, the lithium levels would vary dramatically. And the lower the lithium level in the water, the higher risk of suicide. And in these studies, it also looked at homicide, aggression, and rape. Lower lithium, higher violent crimes, and suicide. This study was repeated um, a number of years later um, in Japan, looked at 18 different municipalities in Japan, and they found the exact same thing. Lower suicide rate associated with higher lithium in the water supply. And then a recent study looked at Austria, um, a sample of 64, 60 measurements, same statistics. There was only one study that looked in England which did not find this dramatic, statistically significant difference. There's lots of questions about the study and if the lithium in England varied sufficiently um, to be able to make a statistical analysis. But for those um, disbelievers uh, from the early studies, there was a repeat study published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research looking at these uh, Texas counties. And again, uh, the lithium um, associated with higher lithium, decreased rates of aggressive crime, and uh, self-aggressive behavior, including suicide. I, I can't uh, share with you how simple and how important these studies are. Um, and you just, um, if you take a minute to, again, just think about it, the lithium in your drinking water affects your behavior and mental health. So this work has been known for a long time. I remember picking up the Discover Magazine in an airport with this headline, um, discussing some of the research I will share with you today. Lithium, this simple metal, oldest drug in psychiatry, might protect the brain from mental illness, Alzheimer's, and other diseases. There's one problem, there's no profit in it. And that is why the research is slow. And that is why um, we're probably not going to get the amount of research that we're going to need to convince some of our colleagues or patients the utility of low-dose lithium. But I will share um, with you today some of the information that we have. I'll be going into much more detail at the um, IMMH conference in San Diego. But just some of the work um, that's helping us understand the importance of lithium as a neuroprotective agent. One, um, a couple of studies started looking at patients with bipolar illness um, and demonstrating that those who were taking lithium had a lower rate of Alzheimer's disease. So one study, British Journal of Psychiatry, 66 elderly patients, chronic lithium therapy, the Alzheimer's disease was diagnosed in three patients, 55% versus 33% who were not on lithium. Decreased Alzheimer's in those that were treated in lithium. We have uh, lots of other studies that I'll be um, uh, you know, discussing in, in San Diego, but here uh, 45 individuals with what we call mild cognitive impairment, um, very low dose of lithium, the one to two milligrams or placebo, double blind, 
And not only was there improvement in cognitive measures in the lithium treated group, but here we begin to see specific neurochemical changes, decrease in the abnormal protein, the tau protein, the phospho tau protein in the lithium treated individuals. And then um, here's another study looking at very low dose, 300 micrograms of lithium with Alzheimer's patients for 15 months. And again, proving the many mental statics exam in those that are treated with lithium. Um, there are many more studies, and we're going to go over some of the mechanisms um, of the incredibly power of low dose lithium. But I, I think, you know, the most important thing I can share with you now is that we know very well what a Alzheimer's brain looks like, the a permanent, uh, you know, uh, uh, damage done by the, um, uh, the, the tau proteins and neurofibro tangles. Um, it's a very hard concept to even begin to treat. We've had no success with our medications, and it's very likely we're not going to have much success with adding lithium uh, to patients with severe Alzheimer's disease. The real goal and the theme that I, I want to try to introduce to you is on a preventative measure um, what could low-dose lithium do for the prevention of dementia or cognitive decline? So I'm going to quickly go through a, um, a lot of theories, uh, mostly of well-documented science-driven uh, science theories as to what is going on. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, for many of you, there'll be common knowledge of this is more complicated because I want to get to the clinical use of lithium uh, for tonight. So one mechanism that we now know that uh, how lithium uh, helps with brain function, that it actually um, is important for um, kind of enhancing the anti-inflammatory activity of the omega-3 DHA. So it increases a compound called 17-hydroxy-DHA in the brain, which is a very powerful anti-inflammatory agent. So one of the mechanisms is decreasing inflammation in the brain. We know that dopa, um, lithium in, inhibits the uh, synthesis and release of dopamine, one of its um, likely effects in terms of treating mania. And what's important here is that it has both presynaptic as well as postsynaptic uh, effects in how it decreases dopamine. Uh, glutamate is a, is a neurotoxin. And again, lithium has um, actions both presynaptically and uh, postsynaptically. And here we're beginning to see some of the uh, genetic influences of lithium. And what happens is we have a inhibition of the synthesis and release of glutamate, as well as changes in gene transcription, which helps downregulate the expression of this NMDA receptor which is where glutamate acts in the brain. GABA, we're all familiar with GABA as a relaxation uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter, and lithium causes inhibition, uh, I'm sorry, stimulation, that's a typo, um, of GABA and upregulation of the receptor. So we have increased GABA. And then my favorite and probably the simplest to understand is lithium's effect on a BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It is really a wonderful marker of neuronal health and, and mood. So the simplest way to think about BDNF, it is a, a peptide. That's a protein found throughout the brain, but um, concentrated in the hippocampus and cortex. If we have high levels of BDNF, we have positive mood, and um, if there's lower levels um, with stress aging, and, and depression. All of our therapies, if you will, that have been shown to be helpful for treatment treating depression, and that could be everything from antidepressants to exercise and fish oil, they all support a BDNF. So we can make a list of all our um, antidepressants, uh, actually from ECT to medications to mindfulness, um, exercise and fish oil, they all increase BDNF. Uh, 
Um, BDNF is uh, what I call miracle grow for the brain. Um, and uh, we increase some um, uh, dendritic branching and we increase the health of the neurons. And we have a couple kind of simple mechanisms where I talked about stress, HPA activation and inflammation, decreasing BDNF. And then our friends, uh, zinc, probiotics, and lithium that enhance BDNF. Um, so uh, probiotics um, taken uh, orally um, can cause increased BDNF. So we have animal studies um, looking at this. And zinc as well, BDNF is a zinc-dependent uh, peptide, so we need adequate zinc to support that. And then lithium is really dramatic, and we have some studies looking at that. So BDNF is a sign of brain health. Anything we can do to increase BDNF, we all feel better. Here was one study in the Journal of Alzheimer's, a randomized uh, single-blind uh, study, 10-week study, and lithium here promoted BDNF in comparison to placebo, and cognitive performance was also correlated with lithium um, serum concentrations. So besides increasing uh, BDNF, we have uh, increase in glutathione synthesis. Glutathione is a major antioxidant in the brain. So we have lots of things that lithium does. Each one of these could be a, a lecture or discussion in itself and probably related to different aspects of mood disorders and or personality. But we have the reduction of major neurotransmitters, dopamine and glutamate, the support of serotonin and GABA, as well as we talked about BDNF. I, I do want to share just to um, continue your interest in, in lithium and cognitive decline. So two of the um, more common mechanisms being looked at for understanding lithium's effect on um, dementia, Alzheimer's, and cognitive de decline is lithium's um, ability to inhibit an enzyme called GSK3, glycogen synthetase kinase. And this enzyme actually stimulates the, the tau and the beta amyloid production in the brain. So if we can decrease GSK, then we're going to decrease these um, beta amyloid uh, accumulation. Lithium does that. And lithium also inhibits an enzyme, IMP, that um, stimulates what we call the autophagy, how our a brain starts decreasing um, the debris, the accumulation of beta amyloid as it starts accumulating. These are the two most well-researched um, uh, uh, mechanisms um, looking at cognitive decline. So we have this uh, essential trace mineral, lithium modulating several biological cascades related to dementia and Alzheimer's, and the question um, that I hope we can all ask and, and stimulate more research is can um, utilizing this low dose lithium prevent the risk into the progression of Alzheimer's? Again, I'll be talking uh, more about this, you know, in San Diego, looking at more detail at the research. But what I want to share with you now is something that I've been doing in my practice for 20 years looking at low-dose lithium as a clinical tool for mood, anxiety, and behavior problems. Typically, when we look at uh, the, uh, the use of lithium, um, we're talking, I'm primarily using lithium orotate. Um, there, lithium is not, uh, can occur free, so it's bound. Um, orotate is, is the most commonly used, is aspartate, and then the prescription medicines are, are carbonate and or citrate. There is um, some uh, minimal research, but lots of um, information on the web that's saying orotate has increased lithium bioavailability. Um, and uh, I believe that um, it's, it's hard to prove. And um, I have found all forms of lithium to be helpful. To me, it's the total dose of um, lithium that is important. 
So these are just some of the cases that I want to share with you um, in how I use um, lithium in uh, clinical practice. This was a, uh, a gentleman, a young boy, Peter, four-year-old, aggressive oppositionally. Um, his aggression was such where he had no friends, and he had to be asked to leave preschool. Um, I routinely look at trace mineral analysis, hair analysis, to look at lithium. Um, so lithium is picked up in, in um, uh, most, and most have a, um, in the reference range. Here you can see there's no detectable lithium. So this um, gentleman was started on uh, liquid micrograms of, of lithium. Um, they usually come in, in droppers, you know, approximately 500 micrograms, depending on where you get the lithium per dropper. This uh, four-year-old was started off at half that, 250 micrograms, um, ended up twice a day with significant improvement in this aggressive um, behavior. He was did not use uh, medication. Uh, this is um, more common of what we're seeing in the practice is um, eight-year-olds diagnosed with ADHD. Um, it's not always the um, typically inattentive type. These are um, individuals that are, tend to be more aggressive, bullying behaviors, and it's not uncommon that stimulants were not helpful. So this, this boy um, tried stimulants, poor response, got more aggressive. If you look at the um, hair sample, no detectable lithium, and uh, was treated um, with lithium. This particular boy was also treated with other um, trace minerals, um, particularly zinc, um, with a significant improvements in that aggressive, um, irritable behavior. Uh, this is an interesting patient. Um, who was older, a history of uh, being diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder, mood swings. She um, had uh, been on Depakote um, doing okay, uh, but came to see us because uh, remained moody and irritable. Um, prescription lithium was not helpful. She had many, many side effects. And um, again, the hair analysis, no detectable lithium. She was placed on 10 milligrams of lithium only with significant improvement in her behavior. There was no change to her medication. She was treated at a boarding school where the medications were being done by another physician. All we did is add nutritional supplements where she was able to leave um, um, her therapeutic school to return um, home. And, you know, here's just a, a little bit of a summary of the kind of cases uh, we're seeing a put together over the course of the year. Um, there's a few I want to kind of talk about in a little more detail, but you can see the themes here. Uh, irritability is probably the most common uh, responsive symptom, uh, road rage, family histories of um, substance abuse and mood disorders, and domestic violence and aggression in the home, as well as um, uh, abuse uh, with kids. So let me take our 43-year-old gentleman with um, presenting to, to the office for road rage, um, but we got a taste of the waiting room rage. So I was probably 15 minutes late at the most um, for his first appointment. He came to see me because I was treating uh, a relative of his, a young boy who was doing quite well. Um, so he came to see me, and um, again, 15 minutes late before I called him into the office, and he proceeded... Um, uh, to uh, spend most of the session, at least 30 minutes, um, extremely angry about how I treated him and how I don't know how to run a business. And um, I found out later he was quite uh, abusive to our office uh, staff as well in that 15-minute wait time. Eventually, we got to some of the story, and um, he described this road rage. I did not see his behavior in the waiting room was inappropriate but a gentleman who got out of his car and screaming at individuals. And his wife and him were both um, concerned about this behavior. He was taking an antidepressant, and all we added was lithium, um, which dramatically uh, decreased um, this anger and this road rage. What was important, um, one, is we did an analysis. Um, he had no detectable lithium, but he had a family history of substance abuse. And if there's 
one uh, of the most important clinical pearls I can share with you is a family history of substance abuse, regardless of whether the patient in front of you has a diagnosed bipolar disorder or a, a substance abuse problem, has been a good clinical indicator of a positive response to a low-dose lithium. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about Patricia. She was a therapist. Um, she had a strong family history of alcoholism, you know, very, very similar to the bipolar family history that I shared with you in the first slide. Um, you know, the kind of family that was uh, frighteningly disabled by alcoholism with um, car accidents and incarcerations and um, significant um, domestic violence. Um, she overcame it. Um, she did have an alcohol problem. Um, she has history of depression, not diagnosed with bipolar, but she was sober for 10 years. She was treating patients and uh, on an antidepressant, came to see me um, for kind of enhanced support. And our first intervention was adding lithium. Uh, this particular individual did not have an undetectable. She had low levels of in her hair, but I, I do remember it was not. It was detectable. But she presented um, to the office, um, you know, six weeks later, and and really was in tears. And her tears um, had to do with the sadness that she started realizing of what it was like for her family, her son, and then her husband, to have lived with her and tolerated, you know, what she calls this irritability and, um, and, and anger that she was not aware of until she took the lithium. And as, as a therapist, as someone who has been uh, treating other people, it was just profoundly uh, striking to her that this kind of chronic anger that um, was not dysfunctional in her world, but, um, you know, she believed took the toll on her family and there was just deep sadness as that resolved, um, sad, tears of joy, as well as regret. Um, I, I could go on and on. Uh, we, we just see a lot of diagnosed ADHD kids um, that were using this low-dose lithium. And again, a family history is critically important to understand um, where to use um, and how to use uh, low-dose lithium. Uh, you know, the research gets interesting. I just throw this in as we have a couple of studies looking at uh, lithium and uh, all-cause mortality in, in Japan and then in our little um, worms, um, lithium extends the life uh, in these worms. And, and something that I do want to uh, talk more about is, again, these incredible neurocognitive um, uh, protective effects of lithium. And this is one study looking at... Um, abnormal brain activity following uh, treatment um, with chemotherapy radiation for women with breast cancer. So uh, this um, impairment uh, tends to last for a couple of years. Some people report it's permanent. And again, the neuroenhancing uh, protective properties of lithium uh, could be a, a tremendous adjunct to our patients that are receiving um, chemotherapy. So, you know, obviously many of you um, listening tonight are interested in integrative therapies. Um, I believe lithium is, is really a, a true, what we call orthomolecular, ortho meaning right molecule. So trying the right molecule for the right individual. It was the basis for um, high dose B3 um, for the treatment of schizophrenia. And what I want to share with you now is how some individuals might have a higher need for lithium than they can get from their uh, supply in their food or soil and might benefit uh, tremendously with improvement in mental health, uh, be it personality characteristics or major mental illness. In the same way, we're looking at vitamin D deficiency and um, fatty acid deficiency. We need to understand um, uh, lithium in our integrative approach to treating mental illness. Um, I think many of you are familiar with um, Bill Walsh, who's done an incredible amount of work looking at um, 
nutrition and brain function. And, and this was just a, a dramatic quote um, from Bill. Um, I became interested in lithium in the 1970s and did a control study comparing the concentrations in the scalp hair of convicted murderers and well-behaved citizens. The data was striking. The killers had roughly one-third the normal range for lithium. We reported at an annual Criminology Association meeting and at the APA, but couldn't get anyone to pay attention. 1970. And here in the 90s, 400 micrograms, tiny dose, um, what we uh, can get in our water supply given to um, patients, you know, with aggression, um, impulsivity, uh, with significant uh, support um, for monitors of, of happiness and friendliness and mood-related parameters. Not a great study, but uh, the, uh, I put it here just to, to show that um, there's been very little done since then. So we, we all, um, I hope, are beginning to understand that the genes are, are not our destiny, that it's a biological liability. And so much of work that I'm doing now is, is taking good family histories as well as looking at genetic markers and, and metabolism to be able to help individuals kind of overcome some of these genetics. And that's the field of epigenetics. We don't change the genes, we change how the genes are expressed. And, and lithium, this is just some examples we'll go through, but lithium has this incredibly um, important role in influencing um, our gene function. I talked earlier about this study, lithium's ability to downregulate the NMDA receptors which means potentially decreased neurotoxicity, decreased inflammation. And, and this was a, one study in, in animals. Um, this was done in mice. So we gave this neurotoxin, NPTP. It destroys dopaminergic neurons in the brain. And what they were able to show, it was a very, very complicated study that I have to admit I did not understand all the uh, cell biology but um, the conclusion was quite profound that lithium affected the expression of more than 50 genes. 50 genes, the expression of these genes um, were supported with lithium treatment. I, I shared with you the anti-suicide properties of prescription lithium and the anti-suicide properties of having lithium in, uh, fortunate to have lithium in your drinking water. Um, we all need to be concerned, and we all should be spending our time and energy understanding and trying to prevent suicide. The most uh, frightening statistic that uh, haunts me um, in my world is this concept that by 2020, there'll be a death from suicide every 20 seconds. Right now, it's approximately every 40 seconds. Someone in the world commits suicide. Second leading cause of death tend to 24-year-olds. Um, Third leading cause of death for college-age kids. For our high school, middle and high school students, 5,400 attempts every day. Suicide, I believe, is, is a preventable illness. I believe um, nutritional factors, we talked about omega-3 in the past, here we have lithium, um, can have a major factor in stimulating these epigenetic changes that might contribute to this self-aggression. We now have clear literature of epigenetic altered um, genes um, in those that uh, commit suicide. So um, here's what I mentioned earlier. This was uh, early 1900s, uh, Wake Up, um, a treatment for hangovers. There were many, many comparable products. But um, what do we do with this information, low-dose lithium? And uh, this was an editorial in the New York Times, September 13th. I thought it was an incredibly well-written article by a psychiatrist, Anna Fells. And she went to a conference, apparently, where someone presented some of the literature I shared with you today about lithium, and it was a well-written art article summarizing the, the studies of the drinking water, some of the neurocognitive protective factors, 
And then she asked this question, what if microdose lithium were again part of our standard nutritional fare, added back to soft drinks, vitamins, put in the water supply, strongly suggest suicide levels would be reduced, even perhaps other violent acts, and maybe the dementia rate would decline. We don't know because the research hasn't been done. Well, I, I thought this was a, a well-written article and asked a great question. And um, I think she got killed in social media and the press and the internet sites about um, the possibility that we would add lithium to our drinking water. And again, the name, the biggest concern with lithium is people's perception of it and the stigma associated with it. People reacted without knowing any of the literature. And, and the vast majority of the uh, internet sites that I read, people were against even thinking or doing research about where low-dose lithium fits in. Uh, we, we have history that we need to learn from. Part of the um, concern with the APA in, uh, in the, and the FDA in approving lithium was a, a very bad mistake that was done in the late 40s, early 50s where um, individuals um, tried to use lithium chloride as a substitute for sodium chloride. This was the beginning of um, salt is evil and it might contribute to hypertension. And so they made a lithium chloride, was sold over the counter, and uh, individuals with hypertension started using it uh, with no regulation or dosages. And there were individuals that started um, putting salt shakers um, on all their food of lithium chloride. And the tragedy is there was uh, many deaths. Well, I, I believe there was at least seven reported deaths um, due to this um, new table salt substitution. Um, I, I've read um, many, many of the case studies. And these were very, very sick individuals, chronic cardiac disease. Um, that uh, uh, were clearly um, not um, healthy individuals. But either way, it kind of skewed the public into lithium now being a, a dangerous mineral that needs to be regulated and concerned about. Um, I, I believe as a trace mineral, it's something that um, uh, I recommend in, in my practice daily. I think many of you are familiar with uh, Jonathan Wright, who's um, been writing about low dose lithium for many years. He takes himself uh, 30 milligrams per day um, as a preventative uh, effect for cognitive decline. I believe he's been up to over now 20 years. Um, and he both supports the literature as well as um, you know, his clinical experience um, with patients. Uh, my, my recommendations are typically 5 to 10 milligrams of lithium as an adjunct to treat the irritability and or mood. I might use higher doses, 10 to 20 milligrams of lithium if I'm treating someone with a history of bipolar disorder who is currently youth time, which means their moods are even and they're trying to get off prescription lithium. Oftentimes we can maintain their moods at this um, 10 to 20 milligram dose. Many of my patients find that they can take 10 milligrams, but they notice themselves getting revved up, irritable, angry, not sleeping. They might increase their dose for a couple weeks, a couple months, and then be able to cut back to a lower dose. The uh, concept of prevention and cognitive decline, we have no literature to support any dosages. And um, my recommendation is five milligrams or less. I think we um, need to be careful of potential side effects that we're not aware of. One of the questions is um, the effect of lithium on um, thyroid function. And it does appear that low-dose lithium um, could affect the thyroid. Um, I believe, um, based on what's in the water supply and my reading of the literature, that two to five milligrams um, would be safe to take uh, long term for the prevention of cognitive decline. So in our integrative orthomolecular approach, if you will, um, we're always struggling to look at metabolism and physiology and, and is there something 
um, that could be treated, whether it's B12 deficiency, hormone deficiency, or a higher need for lithium. And then if we begin to get these causes or these epigenetic changes, then we can really look at um, words like cure and remission um, for the treatment of mental illness. So I'm going to um, stop there. Again, I'll be um, speaking in more detail about lithium at the um, IMMH conference in um, September.